The dwarves delved too greedily and too deep. You know what they awoke in the darkness of Khazadun. Shadow and flame. Do you love space but hate having to actually go there? Are you a massive fan of not having your wealth taken from you and hoarding it in holes under the ground? And do you enjoy digging? If the answer to any of those questions is yes, the subterranean origin in Stellaris Overlord is the origin for you. But how exactly does this origin work and what interesting playstyles will it allow us to have? Let's dive in and find out. Space is great, but sometimes you do want to stay in the comfortable safety of your underground city. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Durin's Folk. Now, they are going to have the Origin Subterranean. This is one of the new origins we've had with Stellaris Overlord. What does this origin do? Well, we've seen a lot, but we're going to now go through in excruciating detail exactly what is going on with this origin. First off, you're going to have the Cave Dweller trait. What Cave Dweller does is it gives us a species minimum habitability of 50%. What that means is that no matter the planet we are on, whether it is not a planet we like, whether it is even a tomb world, we will never get a habitability below 50%. This modifier does not, however, stack with anything else. For example, Adaptive would add plus 10 to our habitability, so if we were on a planet that, like a tomb world with 0% habitability, we would be at a minimum of 50% due to this Cave Dweller trait, but if we had Adaptive that wouldn't go up to 60%, it would still be at 50%. We'll also get an extra 15% minerals from jobs. Unfortunately though, there are a couple of downsides. Our empire size from pops will go up by 10%, which is, though unpleasant, definitely manageable. And quite importantly, our biological pop growth speed will go down by minus 20%. That is quite a big reduction to take for pop growth. Now, in Stellaris, Pops are pretty much the most important resource you have at your disposal as you use your pops to build everything else. Pops work jobs, jobs provide resources. Resources fund your navy, your research, your traditions, your expansion goals as a civilization. So if we have less pops, we won't do as well. While we are living in Khazadum, we'll also get some other things going on. First off, you might notice we get a beautiful, lovely new portrait background for this species, which is an underground city. This shows that we don't in fact live on the surface of the planet, but we live deep in the bowels of its earth. All of our underground cities lead to a 10% increase in building and district costs and minus 10% build speed. Both of those are rather unpleasant, but there are some good things we get in response. All of our colonies will get a massive minus 75% damage reduction from orbital bombardment. That means if anyone is sat in orbit trying to kill us and bombard our worlds, we'll only get 25% of the possible damage they can do, and that is a massive bonus if you want to defend your planets. The last thing we get is our mining districts are uncapped. We add plus two to housing, and every three mining districts will grant us a building slot. This is somewhat like the angler's trait, which meant that agriculture districts are uncapped. And what this basically means is that on any planet, we can build as many mining districts, or in the case of anglers, agriculture districts, as there are available district slots on that world. And that is really quite crazy. The bonuses to housing and the extra building slots we'll unlock are also pretty cool. And if we pair that with something like Masterful Crafters, which as a dwarf species roleplay in space is very, very thematic, then we're going to get our building slots, not just from city districts, but also industrial districts and mining districts. That means you actually might not even need to build hardly any city districts to access your crucial building slots. Generally speaking, the subterranean origin very much lends itself to a playstyle of turtling. You won't necessarily need a navy to be able to defend yourselves if the enemy simply cannot take any of your planets. Getting out something like Resilient to increase your defense army damage will make you nigh untouchable. But we can actually go one step further than being Durin's folk. We can make it even more defensive. And if you enjoy this video, please 
mine that like button. Ladies and gentlemen, enter the rolling space stones. Now, these are subterraneans, but they are also lithoids. And there's some interesting interactions that happen here. As you can see from lithoids, we get a minus 25% to growth speed and assembly speed. However, that would seem to also stack with the minus 20% to cave dweller, but this is only minus 20% to biological pop growth. Meaning if we take a lithoid, we can completely offset some of the negatives from cave dweller because we're already experiencing a minus 25% growth speed. Yes, the species minimum habitability of plus 50% does become mostly irrelevant as lithoids adds a nice plus 50% bonus to our habitability, but overall, these two traits do gel very well together. And while we can go for something like resilient, we can also take a civic like reanimators. And by taking reanimators, we are going to be able to turn our border systems, just our regular worlds, into nigh impregnable fortresses with little to no effort. You will, for the first 50 years of the game, be able to cackle and laugh hysterically as any empire attempts to even attack you. Playing as reanimators will give us access to the Dread Encampment. The Dread Encampment is a very fantastic building. First off, it gives us physics and society research, so it in some ways replaces a research lab. You're going to get similar research out of one of these as you would to a research lab. Now, yes, you won't get any engineering research. You will need general research research labs on your worlds, but it also provides bonuses like defensive armies and naval capacity. On top of that, if we have one of these on our planets, our defensive armies become undead armies, meaning they are no longer affected by morale, have massive health, and are very, very strong army. We can also recruit undead armies, and that will cost us energy instead of minerals, and they'll be produced quite a bit quicker. Now, undead armies are quite a lot better than regular armies, because whenever an undead army kills a regular army, they have a 33% chance of converting that undead army into one of your undead armies, which makes your world nigh impregnable if you put enough forces down. We're going to look at just how crazy and overpowered undead armies, along with these bombardment reduction modifiers, can be in the early to mid game. If you'd like to buy Stellaris Overlord and also support this channel, you can do so by following the link down in the description and purchasing it on the Humble Bundle store. And there's also a sale on most of the Stellaris DLC until the 24th of May. I've jumped ahead about 15 years in the game now. I've generally expanded out. I've put quite a few extra buildings on my capital. I've made sure to grab quite a few research labs to increase my research, and I've grabbed a number of other colonies as well. I do believe the subterranean origin lends itself to a playstyle where you basically go out and grab as many worlds as possible, and then if anyone tries to take any of those worlds, you make it so painful for them that they either give up or they maybe make a very tiny gain from your empire, where they would otherwise make really good gains from someone else, and thus you'll be a very unpalatable target. By taking the unyielding tradition and taking the never surrender, we will get a minus 25 orbital bombardment damage, which will stack with our subterranean trait to give us a total of minus 100% orbital bombardment damage. Now it won't quite be that. And the reason is orbital bombardment reduction is capped out at 98%. So an enemy will still deal 2% damage to you. But if we jump ahead to 2230, where in a bit of a, a pickle, we are now at war. And I'm reporting to you live from Irjama's treasure. The bombs are falling and it is a very loud and costly procedure. Now, we've got a number, we've actually got no assault armies here on this world. Instead, we've got two necromancers and four soldiers. They have collectively provided 1,600 garrison, and the orbital bombardment damage we're receiving on this world is basically zero. Yes, it is going up if we look here, but it's going up by 0.01% per day which is a phenomenally low number. It is going to take literal years before they can increase the bombardment damage, the devastation, to 50%. That will be important because that will shut down the FTL inhibitors on our fortresses. And you are definitely going to want the global defense grid technology. You're going to want to build fortresses and have FTL inhibitors so that you can lock down the enemy fleets and when they are attacking you and continue to turtle up. This build is 
is so overwhelmingly good from a turtling perspective. I think even in an aggressive multiplayer game, you could get away with only building uh, a few dozen destroyers or a few dozen ships in your early wars and use those in a very tactical and surgical way whilst maintaining strong defenses on all of your external worlds. And therefore, you're going to be constantly racking up attrition war score as the game goes on. And you're going to then be able to force status quo peace on enemies that are expending far more resources than you are in terms of their navies. And you'll instead be able to devote that to things like science and economy. What do you think of this new subterranean origin? Let me know down in the comments below. And if they do decide to invade you, you really have nothing to worry about here, ladies and gentlemen. They're going to come in and try and take on our 1,856 garrison. We have a much smaller garrison. Here we go, they're dropping in, ladies and gentlemen. And there is a titanic battle going on. But will it be so devastating and difficult for us? Now, as you can see, our armies are taking regular health damage. They are losing, but every time an enemy army is defeated and killed, there is a chance that we will spawn an undead army and then our army power will go up. It would take many, many numbers, numbers beyond reckoning to breach our fortress worlds. It would take a number beyond reckoning, thousands to storm the keep. Tens of thousands. And this world isn't even really a fortress world. We've simply got a single fortress here with a couple of population working the soldier jobs in preparation for the attack we knew was coming. We might even end up winning this battle with more armies than we started with because our defense armies that will die will respawn. Look, there they're firing in. It is going to be completely bonkers. The enemy will not be able to bombard you down in a timely fashion around 2230. No, no, no. You will be able to simply outlast them from your dwarven stronghold. But that's not the only thing that can happen as a subterranean empire. You can also find some unexpected mineral seams. Now, you can fund it and you can continue to probe deeper and deeper. You can delve greedily and far too deep. And the bonuses for doing this are fantastic. You can get massive bonuses to your mineral output, a massive increase in mining districts. You can also end up with crystal mines. And you, as long as you keep paying energy credits, you can keep digging deeper and deeper. But there is a price for greed, and the price is waking up unimaginable horrors deep below the surface. Yes, you can end up di digging down and awakening a Balrog of Morgoth. And basically speaking, it's that's 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 what it is here. Now, I thought I could deal with this. I even had armies prepared. This foe is beyond any. I kind of knew this event would be coming. I purposefully dug too greedily and too deep. However, my massive armies were woefully unprepared and unmatched for the monstrous terror that was going to be unleashed upon them. And just like in the days of old, Durin the Six was killed and defeated by the Balrog and we lost we lost our world, our home. But basically this army is so fantastically massive that if you do dig too greedily and too deep, it is going to take you a long, long time to be able to defeat this monster. And you would think as subterraneans, there were certain events that couldn't happen, but it turns out there could be people living below those that dwell below. Yes, you can actually find other subterranean civilizations living below your own. And if you do choose to establish communications with them, as a subterranean nation, you will get some special options available. I am very excited with the idea of mantle dwelling aliens, those those aliens that are so foreign to us, uh, us underground dwarven folk that they live literally below our feet. Um, but it is definitely quite cool that this is included as well. Though of course you can uh, issue a proclamation that they should submit and be destroyed if you really want to. Overall, I believe the subterranean origin is a very interesting and unique new origin we have on our table. What I really like about it is that it does provide us the opportunity for new and interesting playstyles. You may lose the battle in space as a subterranean empire, but if they can't remove you from the balls of mud you call home that you are desperately grabbing onto with your calloused hands, 
then it doesn't do them any good. And that is really quite interesting. The potential for this to be a meme build in multiplayer as well does not pass me by. I am very excited to see people using this to its unpleasant and fullest effects. If you want to take full advantage of this subterranean origin, you're probably best going with a biological ascension. But what exactly is a biological ascension and is it really the best option? If you'd like to know more about biological ascension, click the video on screen now.